continuo, continuo. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to you all. Welcome you all to our regular activities of the oncology club. And according to the um, our according to our routine, today is our lecture series and lecture series on the molecular aspects and of the ovarian cancer. Before starting the session, I request our president of this session, oncology club, the chairperson of today's program, Professor Dr. E. M. Haisar, to give us permission for starting the session. Haisar, please. Rahim. Thank you, Dr. Shana. Assalamu alaikum, all the participants, particularly our today's foreign faculty, Dr. U. D. Bapna from Bangalore, and our today's presenter, Dr. Shana Parveen. Dr. Indira, I think we should start immediately. Over to you, Shana. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. As routinely, what we do in this lecture series that our junior doctor, at first our junior doctor, they present, present and after their presentation, they our foreign faculty, they give their presentation and they um, supplement on this, this presentation. Today our presenter is our young gynae oncologist, Dr. Nasrin Hussain. And uh, today our Young presenter today is the gynae oncologist, the Dr. Nasrin Hosses. She is resident professor, gynae oncology, National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital. And our renowned faculty today is Professor Dr. U. D. Bafna Sir. He was the uh, past uh, professor and head of the department of the Kidoi Memorial Hospital, who is a renowned hospital in Bangalore. Now, Sir is working in. Uh, BM Jain Hospital, Bangalore, and also now Sir is the professor and head department of gynae oncology in that hospital. Today with us, our scientific secretary of the oncology club, Dr. A.F.M. Kamaluddin, and general secretary, Professor Dr. A.M.M. Shoriful Alam Sir, he's the general secretary of the oncology club, and our the inspirator, the inspiration, Professor Dr. Yemi Haisar, Sar is the president of the Oncology Club. And in this family, we, no one fights alone. All we fight together. And I think in this process, we can uh, eliminate and control the cancer. And now the end of my session, now I request the, our local faculty, Dr. Nasrin Hussain, to present her, her present, give her presentation. Nasrin, please. Nasty, share your screen. Uh -huh. Share the screen, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to all to this session. And uh, uh, thank you. Nicholas the Craft to inviting me as a speaker in this session. Uh, today's my topic is molecular aspect and a screening of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is the account for two toxins of cancer in women. Women without significant family history and non genetic mutations have one to two percent lifetime risk of developing the disease. Most cases are detected in late stage and prognosis were poor. Contrast to if detected in early, prognosis is excellent. Our ability to screen the disease hampered by lack of knowledge of molecular and biologic event in ovarian cancer. This limited goal of screening to detect the asymptomatic and early stage of disease. The current molecular Ashwin, pathology. Slide share, for instance. Slide share, who dekha jaise na bude. Slide share, for instance. Share screen, for instance. Ha ha. Dekha jaise na pa? Dekha jaise? Maafus. Ham dekha jaise. Change karein. Okay, ठीक है. Okay. ठीक है. Okay. Current molecular pathology suggesting a significant high 
question of hydrocerous ovarian cancer started from pre malignant condition that is serous epithelial intraepithelial carcinoma in the fundiated end of the fallopian tube. This lesion will significantly impact the future screening strategies and current evidence does not support this screening of ovarian cancer. Now I'm speaking about the hereditary ovarian cancer. 8 to 14 percent of ovarian cancer are hereditary. Most of them are caused by germline mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Less commonly, germline mutation in BR1P1, RAD51C, B, PALB2, and BARD1. Other gene also responsible for ovarian cancer is homologous repair pathway genes and DNA mismatch repair genes. Usually, in general population, BRC1 2 mutation frequency is about 1 is to 200 to 1 is to 800. 8% of ovarian cancer found in the domain with Lean syndrome. And ovarian cancer with Lean syndrome due to the mutation in germline mismatch repair genes. In contrast to BRC associated ovarian cancer, in ovarian cancer with Lean syndrome, usually present in early stage and non serous histopathology. Germline mutations are inherited as autosomal dominant pattern. Hereditary ovarian cancer is 10 years earlier than non hereditary ovarian cancer. Starting third person mutated positive women have no significant family history. All women with non mucinous epithelial ovarian cancer should be offered genetic testing irrespective of family history. Inherited BRCA1 pathogens vary in 30 to 40 fold increased rates of ovarian cancer. Developing of cancer by ovarian cancer by age of 40 is 39 to 46 percent, compared to in general population is only 1 to 2 percent. Inherited risk of BRCA1 pathogen is 10 to 20 fold increased rates of ovarian cancer. And at age of 70, the risk of developing ovarian cancer is 10 to 27 percent. Recently, 31 percent high grade serous ovarian cancer is due to defective wheelchair repair pathway. In this case, the pathogenesis. Under physiological condition, DNA double strand break are repaired by rat 51 dependent. HR increase both BRC1 and BR2 are involved. But HR implies the use of homologous sequence in the genome, preferably from sister chromatid, which acts as a template to facilitate the DNA repair in synthetic phase of cell cycle. Beyond that, Blood protein also present in the cytoplasm have been role in the critical in the regulation of the cell division. Effecting double standard DNA repair pathway targeted by inducing a second hit in form of inhibition of double standard DNA repair pathway. Concept of synthetic lethality, a combination of two genetic alterations together result in a Lethal phenotypes leads to inhibitor attendance such as polyadiporipus polymeres, PARP, and involved in single standard base excision repair pathway. Inhibition of DARP leads to persistent of DNA lesion normally repaired by the HR pathway. A normal cell can repair the damage and survive. BRC deficient cells cannot activate the creature systems and die. HR deficient cells, particularly sensitive to chemotherapy induced DNA injury. Now I'm also speaking about the other genes involved in ovarian cancer. The RAD51, C, and B includes mm -hmm. ovarian cancer 2 to 3 fold. BR1P1, that 
increase the fold also two to three fold. Mismatch repair protein, germline mutations in case of uh, lean syndrome, increase the risk of ovarian can cancer. How to have uh, show some insignificance, uh, only insufficient evidence that ATM, MBM, PAL2 genes, and PP53 genes. The risk assessment and genetic counseling. Predict analysis is the most important factor. Ovarian cancer risk depends upon the number of first and second degree relatives with history of epithelial ovarian and breast cancer. And is the onset of the cancer. The degree of risk. Degree of risk is difficult to determine precisely until a pre-degree analysis is performed. All patients should be preferred, referred to a familiar cancer service for genetic counseling. The anyone who had the risk of hereditary cancer based on ovarian cancer, there is a chance it's more than 22.25%. And we recommended the genetic testings that women present with history of personal history of the based on ovarian cancer, women with history of ovarian cancer, and close relatives with ovarian cancer, or premenopausal based cancer. Women with history of who was a homeostasis, disease, and sentencing. History of breast cancer at age of 50 or younger, or close degree ovarian cancer, or more based at MES, close degree with history of known on BRC1 and BRC mutations. And uh, assessment also recommended who had inherited chance of more than 5 to 10 percent chance of breast uh, and ovarian cancer. The breast cancer at age of 40 years or younger, only as with high grade serous ovarian cancer, present women present with bilateral breast cancer, women with breast cancer at age of 50 or younger, close with relatives with breast cancer at age of 50 or younger, breast cancer in any case, two or more close DDT with breast cancer in any Unaffected women with close relatives who meet one of the previous criteria. Now I'm telling this genetic counseling. The decision to be applied, genetic testing involves the three related stages. There is a pre test counseling, more about one part to the ordering the tests, more appropriate test and post test. Counseling. Pre test counseling including the following elements patients' needs and concerns regarding the knowledge of genetic testings, goal of cancer family risk assessment, and details family history that is, collection of comprehensive family history. Here I am speaking about the comprehensive family history means uh, how many family members is affected. That the first degree relatives or second degree relatives is of one set of the cancer start, uh, histopathological type, that means uh, the bilaterality of the ovary. This is um, so, so many information collected from the um, using the genetic testings. Detailed medical and personal history. A focused physical examination when indicated, generate uh, a differential diagnosis and educate the patient on inheritance patterns, penetrance, express variability, or expressivity. Preparation for possible outcome of testing, including the positive, true negative, uninformative negative, uncertain variable, and mosaic results. Obtain written informed consent. Discuss possible management option if mutation identified outside the inherited cancer risk to relatives. Test of genetic testing, 
and final legislations regarding the genetic discriminations and privacy of genetic information. With most preferable option than single gene testing. Multi gene testing for ovarian cancer, most important among them BRC1, BRC2, CDH1, PLB2, PTM, QT53, MSS2, MSS1, MSS16, PMS. Why I'm speaking that? Genetic risk assessment based on the genetic test result. The ovarian genes, there is a the risk of ovarian cancer is strong, but absolute risk is less than 3%. But there is a not recommended for risk reduction sulfingo predictably. Management depends upon the family history. In terms of BRC1 positive, and one and two, both positives, there is a strongly strong increased risk of ovarian cancer. And in case of BRC1, the risk is 39 to 58. And in case of BRC2, there is a 13 to 29 percent risk of ovarian cancer. BRC2, there are average eight to 10 years later than BRC1 mutation. The development of that ovarian cancer. So, BRC1, we recommended uh, risk reduction sulfingo predictively in case 35 to 40 years. It depends upon the completion of their family. And uh, in case of BRC2, it is uh, easily advocated 40 to 45 years upon the completion of the child bearing. BRNP1, the evidence is strong, but absolute risk greater than 10 percent. Consider BRCA1 30 or 45 to 50 years. And MSH1, MSH2, MS16, PMS2, strong risk of ovarian cancer, but the absolute risk is greater than. The absolute risk is greater than 10 percent. PMS2, the increased risk is limited, but absolute risk is than 2 percent. PALB2, increased risk strong, that is a 3 to 5 percent, but insufficient evidence to risk reduction sulfur for activity management based upon the family history. Around 51 C and D. The evidence and the strong risks, risks less more than 10 percent. So, the, the considers risk reduction sulfate of at 45 to 50 years. SPK 11, there is a strong risk of ovarian cancer, specifically non epithelial ovarian tumors, and more than 10 percent. And the patient the uh, new evidence is uh, well established. Speaking about the ovarian cancer screening, the target population of ovarian cancer screening, the general population and high risk population. General population, most of the ovarian cancer are sporadic. More than 90% sporadic cancer in women older than 50 years. The screening studies in the general population usually target this group. High risk population, the family relatives of affected members from ovarian, breast, breast and ovarian, all lean syndromes, who have a greater than 10% lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancers are considered to be high risk population. Cancer screening trial. So, distinct screening strategies now we are used but based on ultrasonogram, measurement of serum C125 with ultrasonogram as the second long testing. This is the multimodal screening mode. Here I am just uh, telling you about the one important trial in general population. There is the UK collaborative trial of ovarian screening. 
uh, who I use the patient is distributed is to the annual multimodal screening, annual transversal ultrasonogram screening, and control group. The ratio is to one is to one is to two. Primary and cancer mortality, secondary endpoints, physical morbidity, cost, and class, and psychological morbidity. The result of this study, the median 11 years follow-up, 0.6% ovarian cancer diagnosed. Among them, 0.7% in MMS group, 0.6% in USS group, 0.6% in human screen group. In case of mortality, there is a 0.29% in MMS group, 0.3% USS group, 0.2% in on screen group. So, no significant difference in mortality. So, based on the available data, the role of screening remains contentious. Here, I am also mentioned that another important study is the type of screening trial. Here the two arm, there is a 78, more than 78,000 women included. There is a study group. Annually, 725 and TVS was done and control group. If abnormal result, anyone referred to fish this year. The median follow up of 12.4 years found the prime A endpoint is ovarian cancer mortality, the 77% is skin disease, 78% on usual care group. So no significant difference in mortality. Recent update of this trial, it, by, still, it's six years, additional follow-ups, and from that, there was no reduction in mortality associated with screening. <laughs> Population. Some evidence of a hereditary predisposition is screening 235 words frequently advocated, but efficacy of such survival is yet to be determined. Heritage population who request screening should be counseled about the current lack of evidence for efficacy of both CN25 and ultrasonic screening. Both tests associated with high false positive rates. Especially in case of premenopausal women. Women advise to have risk reduction solving of people at completion of their families. At present, training cannot be considered an effective alternative. So, training is also ineffective in women at high risk ovarian cancer because of strong family history or non BRCA mutation. What I'm uh, just uh, in short about the risk, the risk of ovarian cancer, cancer algorithm. Calculating the risk of having a trans point based on the AMN cells and C125 cells. And calculating, calculation is implemented in a screening program by testing a decision at each level of risk. With in row form, the intermediate and elevated risk is defined first a low level screening intervention, second a high level screening intervention. C125 tested annually, intermediate row risk, C125 tested everything, and a risk is recalculated. Elevated row risk triggers the referral to a transvaginal scan. We just said that the risk of yoga is supposed to help improve the efficacy of screening. In the first shock scan, we had a total of 4,000 women that did not show a reduction in mortality, even every four months, still wanted to have the others. But there is a spaceship was apparently observed with 48% of skin detected cancer stages one or two. So take message that all cancer developed as a result of mutation in certain genes. 
Peridotal cancers are characterized by transmission of mutation genes to offspring through the mothers and orphans. Effective method of screening for ovarian cancers. Screening for ovarian cancer with C125, ultrasound, and cardiac marker is not recommended for general population based screening. The field of cancer genetics has implicated all aspects of cancer management with hereditary or ovarian cancer, including the prevention, screening, and treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nasreen Hussain, for your presentation. Please stop your share screen, Nasreen, please. Now, as we have started this program in this way that our junior doctor, the present in the foreign, the faculty and the renowned the uh, faculty in front of them, them, they can present, they know how they can present and they can learn the, from their, our foreign faculties. They now our the presenter is our faculty professor Dr. Ud Bafnasar. Bafnasar he was working in Kidwai Memorial Hospital around 30 years, which is the renowned hospital in Bangalore, and he has more than 50 peer-reviewed publication. And he was instrumental in starting laparoscopic and robotics in gynecological oncology, and he manages the he has the uh, all the patients comprehensively both in preventive side, surgical side, chemotherapy, and targeted treatments. So we choose the SAR for this presentation. SAR, please, I request SAR to go through his presentation. Yeah. Uh, that's a very nice presentation by Dr. Hussain. Uh, as far as uh, I think ovarian cancer uh, screening is concerned, as he has told very rightly that currently there is no evidence for ovarian cancer screening in the general population. And uh, in developing countries like India and Bangladesh, our main concern is cervical cancer screening. And we are at to start population-based screening program for cervical cancer. And it's going to be all the more difficult to do a similar kind of trial, what was done in the UK and in the USA, using uh, serial estimation of CA125 and transvaginal sonography, which are, which are expensive tests. So I don't think uh, our population is ready for such a screening program. So what we have learned from this, uh, from the UK trial and from the USA trial is that these kind of screenings are not very useful in reducing the mortality. But what the screening can do in high risk population is that uh, even though the mortality may not be reduced, uh, uh, there is a possibility of uh, reducing the mortality if you compare uh, the disease stage-wise. There is a shift in the stage if you do screening for high-risk population, especially for uh, patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Uh, you have to monitor the uh, person who has got BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation very closely. You just cannot ignore them. So what is recommended uh, is short-term surveillance. So any patient who has got BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation has to have a short-term surveillance. Long-term surveillance is not recommended. What I mean by short-term surveillance is that you start surveillance uh, as early as 20 years of the age in the patient who has got BRCA mutation, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation and you have to follow them up with serial estimation of CA125 and transvaginal sonography every four monthly, which is practically difficult in our country. Uh, so what I would recommend is that uh, 
at least we must have some alternative approach which are practical in our countries uh, it has been shown in a recent publication that oral contraceptive pills uh, can reduce the risk of development of epithelial ovarian cancer in patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation by 50%. So what I do with my patient is that instead of uh, asking them to very strictly do serial estimation of GA125 and transvaginal sonography, which most of them don't do it, I recommend them to take OC pills after they have completed the family or if they are not planning family, they can take OC pills. Once the family, uh, the international guidelines say that risk reducing sulfingo-oophorectomy is recommended at the age of uh, between 35 to 40 years or at the completion of family. But in our countries, uh, the family is completed at a very early age. Some, some patients have completed, have completed their family at the age of 22, 23 or 24 also. So doing risk reducing sulfing at 22 years or 25 years old, most of them uh, would not agree and it is not practical. So what I recommend my patient is that the young patients who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, I recommend them to take OC pills. And uh, at the age of uh, say around 35 years, or you must look at the age of the relative who had ovarian cancer. At what age they had ovarian cancer? Supposing that a relative had a, a ovarian cancer at the age of 35 years old, when she was 35 years old, so better do risk reducing sulfing of oophorectomy at least five years earlier. So instead of a uh, strict criteria of doing risk reducing sulfing of oophorectomy between 35 to 40 years, uh, you, can, uh, you can vary your uh, uh, age guidelines depending on the age at which the cancer has developed in the relative. So you may do risk reducing sulfing of oophorectomy around say 30, 35 years. Uh, till then, you must advise them to take uh, oral contraceptive pills. So this is what I would like to talk about the uh, screening. And uh, secondly, uh, Dr. Hussain has uh, spoken about the molecular classification of uh, ovarian cancer. So we all know that uh, the ovarian cancer, especially epithelial ovarian cancer, have uh, two uh, subtypes, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 are common high-grade serious cancer, which account for 70% to 80% of all the epithelial ovarian cancer, and they are associated with uh, T53 mutation. Okay. And uh, about 10% of this high-grade serious cancer have associated BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. In a study done in India, the incidence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation was much higher. I don't remember the exact percentage, but I think it's around 20%. So large number of patients would have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Uh, so all the patients uh, with uh, high-grade serious ovarian cancer, we should advise them to undergo BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation study. And uh, uh, apart from BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation study, it is my observation that uh, many patients with strong family history, two or three first-degree relatives having ovarian cancer or breast cancer, they may not have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. So in the absence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, you must look for other genes which are causing familial ovarian cancer as presented and as shown to you by Dr. Hussain very nicely. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing should be recommended to all the patients with high-grade epithelial ovarian cancer. But practically, it's very, very difficult <clears throat> because these tests, tests are expensive. Most of our patients cannot afford, but it is our duty to tell them about uh, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic testing. 
and uh, <clears throat> the type 2 cancers uh, they have different genetic profile they are low grade cancer type 2 cancers are low grade cancer mainly you have what is called as low grade serous ovarian cancer then you have mucinous cancer and you have a clear cell cancer also comes under type 2 so mucinous cancer endometrioid cancer and low grade serous cancer they all belong to type 2 cancer these two type 2 cancers do not respond to chemotherapy they are uh, associated with KRAS and VRAF mutation and we do not have any good chemotherapy for type 2 cancers. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, many uh, 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 targeted therapies are being investigated in this uh, type 1 cancer, sorry type 1 cancer. Low grade cancer is type 1 and high grade is type 2 cancer. I think I made a mistake. Low grade is type 1 and high grade is type 2 cancer. So type 1 cancers that is low grade serious cancer, clear cell cancer, and mucinous cancers, we do not have good chemotherapy. The main stay of treatment would be surgical debulking. And uh, chemotherapy is not very effective for this kind of patients. So we have to uh, rely on targeted uh, therapies which are under trial, which are undergoing clinical trials. So I think I'm sorry, I do not have a PowerPoint programs because I was not told to prepare a PowerPoint program. Otherwise, I would have made the PowerPoint uh, slides. I do not have PowerPoint slides. So I just uh, uh, presented to you my personal practical experience. Thank you. Back to Dr. Sahana. Yes, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Please comment on the pathogenesis of the ovarian cancer. Pathogenesis. Sorry about the pathogenesis of the ovarian cancer. Okay. Pathogenesis of ovarian cancer, as I mentioned to you, oh, the high-grade cancers, uh, high-grade serious cancer, they originate, uh, originate supposed to originate from the femoral end of the tube. Uh, and the precursor, precursor uh, condition is called as stick, serous tubal intraepithelial cancer. This is supposed to be a precursor of high-grade serous cancer. Whereas uh, type 2 cancers uh, do not have any well-defined uh, precursor. And type 2 cancers have different uh, origin and uh, endometrioid cancers and uh, clear cell cancer may be associated with uh, chronic endometriosis. So high-grade cancers, they originate from stick, whereas uh, low-grade cancers, uh, they may originate uh, in the background of endometriosis. And the type 1 cancers have association with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, and they are familial. Whereas uh, low-grade cancers are not familial and they usually do not have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. You have told that the, those patients, we shall have to do the screening for the ovarian cancer who have the genetic that the BRCA positive. So it is most costly than that of the, the TBS or the um, C125. Yes. So whom patients, those whom, they who are not even maximum of our patient, they are not capable of doing the, the BRCA testing. In that cases, to those patients whom we advise this type of the screening. Yeah, yeah, same story in India also. Um, most of our patients, uh, uh, especially coming to a government hospital like Itwai Cancer Hospital, uh, which deals with the uh, uh, general public, most of the general public uh, uh, would not be able to afford BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic testing. And uh, uh, screening uh, with uh, TVS and CA125 also is not recommended as shown by the UK trial and as shown by the prostate, lung, colorectal and ovarian cancer that screening for ovarian cancer should not be done for general population. 
screening is uh, recommended or may be done only for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutant patients. Two, you have to do a short term surveillance till the age of 35 to 40 years because we have a good preventive measure in risk reducing something ophorectomy. So instead of relying on uh, screening, uh, we must offer them risk reducing something ophorectomy. That is more effective than doing uh, screening at the general population level. Thank you, sir. Dr. A.K. Goodman, please comment on this, that today's presentation and also the uh, molecular, about the molecular testing in our pers perspectives and also the BRCA testing about this and also the ROCA and other the, uh, comment on the pathogenesis of this. Okay, please. Oh, first of all, I would say that's a fan, that was a fantastic lecture. Dr. Hossein, very, very wonderful. I love Slides. They're awesome. I love the uh, sort of breakdown of all the different genetics. Um, and it's incredibly helpful. So uh, th that, that's wonderful. In terms of the pragmatics of testing, just as Dr. Bhatna said, and thank you so much for those really smart comments, and, and I resonate and agree with everything that you said, you know, for sure unrelated to the science, and this is the big struggle everywhere, but especially among poor women in environments where they do not have healthcare insurance or have the ability to go to a government funded institution to get healthcare, making economic decisions about their healthcare or their families are making economic decisions about their healthcare. That's a a huge topic of social determinants of health. That's really not part of our conversation today, but it always plays in the decision-making in terms of the physicians who care for women who are poor, who cannot afford care, will make that, that'll be part of the math about what you recommend for your patients, isn't it? So, so that's, again, unrelated to the science. There's the science and there's the life. There's the reality of the environment that you live in. And I think that's what Dr. Shahana is alluding to here. Um, and you know better than anybody how you, you navigate that. I do think that you can consider, as Dr. Bhadna says, being pragmatic based on family history uh, to decide, is there a group of women that you would offer risk-reducing surgery to based on breast cancer risk, based on family history. So that doesn't take, that's not expensive, right? Taking a good history, medical history and a family history with your patients is not, there's no, there's no money involved in that, right? So you can do a very good, diligent job tracing out a family tree if possible to help understand sort of what may be going on for the particular patient that you have. So. With that in mind, in the olden days, previous to the ability to do genetic testing, that's all, that's all, that's all we had. We knew there was a subset of women, maybe 25%, who had a family history. And for those women, we recommended risk-reducing surgery. Now, with gene panels, we can increase the number of women to offer genetic, uh, to offer risk-reducing surgery to. Um, so th th those would be my comments on that. I want to just bring up a few things that have not been mentioned because they're really interesting to me and I, I suspect to y'all. Um, the one is the actual surgical technique of risk reducing surgery, okay? So we talk about, ah, we're gonna take out people's ovaries and fallopian tubes and that's gonna, that's gonna fix the problem. But you really also need to think about the, as surgeons, what's the technique that you're using? Are you truly removing the whole ovary? Okay, there are many ways that someone can do a salpingo ophorectomy. A very common way is to stay intraperitoneal to just come across the infundibular pelvic ligament at the level of the ovary off the pelvic brim and then walk your way back to the uterus, all right? You do run the risk with that technique of leaving an ovarian remnant, 
okay? And so I just want to make a push for being thoughtful about where is it that you ligate your gonadal vessels? You know, do you ligate them right at the ovary? Do you give yourself a few centimeters off the ovaries, approximately up towards the, you know, um, the origin of the gonadal vessels? And potentially what we call peritoneal cancers, you know, there's that, what is it, less than 10% risk in women who've had the removal of their ovaries and fallopian tubes of getting what we call peritoneal cancer. This is this huge mystery. What is that exactly? Why would, you know, mystically the peritoneum suddenly develop this thing that looks like ovarian cancer? Is it possible it's an ovarian remnant? Okay, so that's my one point. My second point is there's probably is a subset of women where we should think about taking out their uterus, all right? And that's a genetic issue. There's a sub, not everybody, but as a subset in the genetic group where they have a higher risk of a serous cancer of the uterus, okay? Potentially family history may help. I think we haven't really sorted that out at this moment, but there's some papers out there that suggest it. And the final thing, there's also a subset that get appendiceal tumors. So there might be a subset of women where you want to think about prophylactically removing the appendix. Again, this doesn't apply to everybody, but it's something that's sort of kind of in our list of, of questions that we don't totally have an answer to. Anyway, those are my, my comments. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. So what is your recommendation for removal of the appendix? Again, please. Removal of appendix. Sorry, having technical difficulty. Yeah, um, well, um, I'm kind of free with my appendix appendices. It's like, it takes a minute to, to come across it and take it out. I would say that for all mucinous tumors, it's a recommendation. So that's a standard of thought. Again, depending on what your family history is, if you have any idea about the histology of other family members, that's something to consider. All right, so, so those would be the, the two things to think about. Uh, in the setting of endometriosis, we do have a subset of cancers that arise in endometriotic implants. And in the setting where you're doing a surgery for either risk reducing or you have a, a cancer that has to do with endometriosis, look at the appendix. If there's any implants there, I, I definitely take it out. So those would be my thoughts about the appendix. The bottom line is it's a really easy surgery to do. You could make it your standard that you're just going to take it out and that therefore you never need to worry about it. Um, uh, and it takes, like I say, it's just a small, small piece of surgery. But again, that, that will be the individual surgeon's thoughts. Bapna, sir, what is your recommendation, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in uh, India, at least, uh, uh, with the strong family history of ovarian cancer, and when we have not done any kind of genetic testing, because of non-affordability, we advise them risk-reducing salvingoferectomy. Uh, now, the question uh, raised by Dr. Anna Catherine is that uh, you should you can, may also do hysterectomy also. In I think uh, our country, uh, when whenever we are doing risk-reducing salvingoferectomy, we also remove the uterus also. Okay, the strictly speaking, it is not indicated. There is no need to remove the uterus. Uh, but uh, uh, as a policy or as a, as a trend, I think uh, along with risk reducing sulfing operectomy, we also try, try to remove the uterus uh, when we do not know the exact genetic mutation, whether we are dealing with BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation, or whether we are dealing with uh, uh, mismatch repair mutation associated with Lynch syndrome. We do not have the exact uh, genetic mutation. In those patients, uh, we remove the uterus as well. So that is much cheaper rather than doing genetic testing. So any person with a strong family history, two members, two first degree relatives having breast cancer and ovarian cancer, even without genetic testing, uh, I would like to recommend uh, risk reducing sulfingoferectomy along with hysterectomy. 
And uh, if you are able to afford the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation study, and if they have BRCA1 and 2 mutation and the uterus is normal, you can uh, preserve the uterus. You can just remove the uterus. So you can just remove the fallopian tube and you can remove the ovaries and you can leave behind the uterus. That is much simpler procedure with lesser morbidity. Sometimes unnecessarily, if you try to remove the uterus, you may end up with uh, some kind of uh, morbidity. When you don't want to do it and you do do it, you may end up with some uh, ureteric fistula or bladder fistula. So unnecessary hysterectomy should be avoided unless you are uh, expert in doing laparoscopic hysterectomy uh, or unless uh, you are dealing with uh, uh, mismatch repair uh, gene mutation study, which you have with you. Only then you should remove the uterus. Otherwise, uh, uh, probably I think when you have a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, risk reducing sulfing oophorectomy should alone suffice without removal of the uterus, unless the uterus is also having disease like uterine fibroid or in any other uh, menstrual abnormality, you don't, remove, don't have to remove the uterus. Sir, as you know, in our country, we, the people are very much conservative. So they, if, even if we advise them, they are not, they don't agree to do this sulfing oophorectomy. In that cases, we may advise her the oral contraceptive pill. Yes. Yeah. Same thing. Same story in India also. Uh, I have many patients. Uh, my personal experience uh, have a strong family history. Some we have two extreme kind of people. Uh, people who are very 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 scared uh, and they want the uterus and the ovaries and tubes to be removed. The people who are educated and uh, they are those who have. Uh, because they, or those who are economically strong think they want the uterus and the ovaries and tubes to be removed. But on the other hand, uh, some other kind of people, even if uh, we tell them that there is a risk of developing ovarian cancer, they are not willing for risk reducing sulfuric oophorectomy because they are simply afraid of undergoing any kind of surgery. Many of my patients, I advise them for risk reducing sulfuric oophorectomy, but they are unwilling. So this is the practical problem we are facing in India, and I'm sure that similar kind of problems you are facing in Bangladesh also, because culturally, cult culturally we are same, both Bangladesh and India, we are same. Uh, so I think this kind of patients, uh, at least you should advise them oral contraceptive pill for a long time, long, long time. You have to advise them oral contraceptive pill. Oral pills are not going to reduce the risk completely. But at least the risk is reduced by at least uh, 50%, not 100%. That should be kept in mind. 100% risk cannot be uh, reduced by giving oral contraceptive pills. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Asma Habib had a question or a comment. Asma? Question, just I'm seeing. Please put your question in the chat box. Asma, please put your question on the chat box. And if the other, please, if you have any question, please raise your hand. So I was just going to su uh, support uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Nas' uh, comment that um, about the hysterectomy. And again, in an environment where there's a lot of cervical cancer unrelated to the genetic risk. Um, of uh, the rare serous endometrial cancer, you're, pra you're being pragmatic here. One surgery, if you don't think there's going to be a super increased morbidity, I understand that. You know, in the United States, we do everything laparoscopically and a laparoscopic BSO is like a 30 minute procedure, very quick. You know, it, uh, it's, it's a much smaller thing. Plus our insurance companies will not cover the hysterectomy unless there's a medical reason for the removal that we can justify. You, you have any question, please put the question in set box or otherwise you please raise your hand.
Narsma Habib, her question is role of routine sulfinjectomy in prevention of ovarian cancer in hysterectomy for uterine benign pathology. Yeah, we do that routinely now. Uh, where I, in, in a young woman where we're doing ovarian preservation and the, the removal of the uterus is for say cervical cancer uh, or for fibroids or some other reason that, that doesn't require the removal of the ovaries. We routinely do uh, the removal of the uh, fallopian tubes. The danger, of course, is that the fallopian tubes, if you look at the fimbriated end, they can be really quite stuck on the ovary. And if you really think that you want to um, do the removal of the fallopian tubes for reduction of cancer risk, you have to be thoughtful that you're removing all of the, uh, the ends of the fimbriated end. Yeah, the question was, I think, uh, for when you are doing hysterectomy for yes, benign conditions, uh, when you are doing hysterectomy for uterine fibroid, yes, sir. What the age, uh, whether we should remove the uh, fallopian tube or not. Thank you. I think yes. the answer is, I think, yes. I think uh, in a younger woman who is undergoing hysterectomy, we would like to preserve the ovaries. Uh, at the same time, we would like to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer and fallopian tube cancer. So uh, I think I would recommend uh, a routine sulfonylectomy in uh, patients who are undergoing hysterectomy for benign pathology. So whenever you are removing the uterus, you remove the fallopian tube. If not fallopian tube, at least the femoral end should be removed. Because sometimes what happens is that when you try to remove the fallopian tube completely, you may compromise the blood supply to the ovary. As you know that ovary has got dual blood supply from the ovarian artery as well as from the uterine artery. And if you remove the uh, fallopian tube along with the mesosalpings uh, completely, then you may compromise with the uh, blood supply to the ovary coming from the uterine artery. And uh, this, these are the ovaries uh, who are likely to become cystic and uh, they may undergo uh, torsion in future. So, so whenever you are doing sulfonylectomy, I think better you try to preserve the mesosalpings and remove the only the tube, or you try to remove only the femoral end, so so that the blood supply to the ovary is not compromised. Sir, we have found that the sometimes there are the uh, ladies who have the long-standing endometriosis at the um, many ladies they develop the endometriotic or the clear cell carcinoma. In that cases, what should they do? The long standing endometriosis, after that, at the 10 years or five years, they develop the endometriotic, the either endometrial type of or clear cell carcinoma. In that cases, what is your advice? Uh, endometriosis is associated with, uh, uh, mainly with clear cell cancer. Yes, sir. And sometimes with endometrial cancer. Okay, and uh, clear cell cancer incidence uh, is not very common in Asian countries. It is more commonly seen in Japan, uh, where, where it is as high as 10%. Whereas uh, in our country, I think uh, it is uh, less than around 2 to 3%. Um, so I think uh, uh, clear cell cancer prevention, uh, whenever you have endometriosis, uh, I don't think you have any diff different guidelines. Uh, you just treat the endometriosis uh, and uh, hope that uh, patient would not develop uh, ovarian cancer, that is clear cell cancer of the ovary. And anyway, most of these patients uh, would be getting OC pills nowadays. Uh, whenever you have endometriosis, either you undergo a surgical excision of the endometriomas or patients who, has got, uh, who are not fit for surgery, they are recommended uh, OC pills. But OC pills are known to prevent uh, all kinds of ovarian cancer, all kinds of epithelial ovarian cancer, whether BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation is there or not. So OC pills are known to prevent uh, uh, at least type 1 ovarian cancer, that is high-grade ovarian cancer. And clear cell cancer, I am not sure. I don't think any data is there whether OC pills can prevent uh, clear cell cancer. But overall, OC pills are known to reduce uh, the incidence of ovarian cancer by 
50 percent but i cannot specifically talk about clear cell cancer whether oc pills can prevent clear cell cancer or not i'm not very sure so there is another question pco and its connection to the ovarian cancer PCOD, I think, uh, 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 I don't think it has got any association because most of these patients have to have annihilation. They don't have, uh, as you know, that ovarian cancer is associated with incessant ovulation. More is the chance of ovulation, more is the risk of developing high-grade serious cancer because of continuous injury of the ovarian epithelium during ovulation. So when the ovulation is suppressed, as, hap as happens in PCOD, the risk of development of ovarian cancer would actually decrease. But the risk of developing endometrial cancer, on the other hand, would increase in the patients with PCOD because they are uh, unavailatory and there is unopposed action of the estrogen on the endometrium. So these are the patients who are likely to have endometrial hyperplasia and they may end up with uh, endometrial uh, well differentiated adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. But uh, uh, risk of ovarian cancer, I, I don't think there's any increased risk of ovarian cancer. Unless uh, these are the patients also receive uh, ovulation induction drugs. They are uh, patients who are undergoing treatment for infertility and they are uh, repeatedly, they are subjected to ovulation induction. <laughs> Controversy is there whether ovulation induction as such per se would increase the risk of uh, ovarian cancer. And some studies have been shown that uh, excessive uh, ovulation induction for more than a year, whether you use clomiphene citrate or whether you use GNRH analogs, uh, if you continuously go on inducing the ovaries, continuously go on stimulating the ovaries, the risk of borderline ovarian tumor is increased in these patients. And this is my observation also. Many patients with infertile infertility, they have uh, reported with borderline ovarian tumor. Whether it is just an association or whether it is a cause is not very, very clear. Another question is from Rohima Begum. If only liver of the fibrillated end of the fallopian tube is enough, then why fimbriectomy? Which one is better? No, as I mentioned to you, I think uh, for high-grade serious cancer, it is believed that even though it is the ovarian cancer, the origin is from the tube, origin is from the femoral end. Okay, so origin, ovarian cancers do not originate from ovary. This is uh, hypothetical, this is the theoretical mainly yes. theoretical. It may not be absolutely the truth. Because uh, uh, high-grade ovarian cancers are known to be associated with stick or serous tubal intraepithelial cancer, the stick, stick lesion is mainly confined to the femoral end and not to the uh, uh, main uh, tube, main body of the fallopian tube. So femoriectomy alone can prevent ovarian cancer, high-grade ovarian cancer, in large number of patients. But it is not going to completely eliminate ovarian cancer because you are preserving the ovary also. So if you want to completely remove the risk or you want to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by 90 to 95%, then you have to remove both the tube and the ovary. If you want to remove only the femoral end, the risk is decreased, but some amount of risk would still remain. So younger patients uh, remove the fem do the femoriectomy if you want to preserve the ovarian function if you want to preserve the uh, onset of premature menopause you preserve the ovaries uh, and remove only the fimbrial end especially when you are doing hysterectomy for benign conditions but in older women with strong family history undergoing hysterectomy for benign causes uh, better to remove both the tube and the ovary Whenever you have a strong family history, remove both the tube and the ovaries. Whenever there is no family history, then you can just uh, remove the femoral end to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer and to prevent premature onset of menopause.
ओके मैम प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ if we have no more questions now i would like to request our scientific secretary dr rafim kamaluddin to comment on today's presentation dr kamaluddin bhai please so thank you shahana uh, it is great to meet uh, virtually dr bafna and ak and nasrin made a wonderful presentation with so many information so i heard a lot about dr bafna from my good friend dr gobind babu who was his colleague in kidwai okay. so today it's a opportunity to meet him virtually well thank you so, thank you so much uh, i mean uh, he talked a lot about you when i was talking about some you know gynecological gynecologist in india okay okay so he uh, today i understand he was talking about you okay okay so it was great to meet you and i'm sure all our participants were uh, benefited from the great discussion because the today's discussion is something is very important but we hardly discuss and think about it because we always think that ovarian malignancy will be diagnosed at a metastatic stage and we will be doing some debulking and chemotherapy that is what our mindset comes but still there are some spaces where we can really look for the early diagnosis and also the risk group analysis and all these things that you have been telling like the tbs one that you said that we suggest tbs but majority of them don't do it so these are the real, real life scenarios so i'm sure i mean this discussion was interesting and beneficial for all of us and like always i am very grateful to all the participants this 100 plus participation is only possible in gynae oncology platform and with the initiative of shahana and definitely the main attraction is the local and foreign faculties heads up to all the few and we on behalf of oncology club is committed to support this program and we expect that the support from you people like you and ak from usa will be supporting us so that we can carry this program forward end of the day we all are working so that we can give the best to our cancer patient because we believe that every patient in the whole world cancer patient deserves the best treatment irrespective of geographical boundary and today when we can really share our knowledge so we should we should cross the boundary and start sharing our knowledge and enrich ourselves maybe we will have some limitation of resources maybe we will have some limitation of drugs but we should not have the limitation of knowledge so that is the motto of oncology club and we we are going forward with it and thanks to shahana for arranging this and continuing this thank you very much thank you dr kamaluddin bhai before that do we have the another the participant dr onju dr probably she is dr onju rani from lucknow i please request mahapus please unmute dr onju's iphone mahapus please she has raised her dr onju please Hi Sana, very good evening to all of you. Nice to see you, Sana. <laughs> Actually, Dr. Babna is wonderful. He yes. has uh, cleared most of our queries. Just I also wanted to ask, sir, uh, like uh, 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 for um, prophylactic surgery, only fimbriectomy is good enough, uh, rather than doing whole self whole tube self injectomy. That's what. Uh, and if patient is young, we can preserve ovary. So. Uh, probably uh, dr bafna has answered this question and one more thing is i would like to ask sir that many endometriosis patient comes with uh, hemorrhagic ascites and pleural effusion yes. in these set of patient is the risk of malignancy is high i mean just it was endometriotic patient uh, presenting with ascites ascites and uh, uh, i am going to treat the patient sir with the pleural effusion Yes, sir. and they responded to uh, 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 the surgery and the diagnosis we started but just i'm uh, afraid that such patients are having high risk for uh, developing this uh, clear cell carcinoma sir yeah yeah endometriosis uh, long standing uh, endometriosis is uh, known to be associated with uh, clear cell cancer there's no doubt about it but endometriosis presenting with uh, ascites presenting with pleural effusion in absence of malignancy very very unlikely i think whenever there is a pleural effusion yeah 
think there would be some malignancy as well as such. Okay. Uh, or maybe probably endometrium has ruptured and caused the hemorrhagic ascites. Uh, yes. And hemorrhagic ascites sometimes can irritate the diaphragm and cause uh, uh, reactionary pleural effusion. What is the other possibility? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, because we have ruled out uh, the possibility of malignancy in uh, the, these two patients we are having, and they responded to uh, this medical treatment because they both are very young. So they responded to the medical treatment. Uh, both are doing well right now, but probably after stopping the drugs, it might recur. Yeah. So uh, let's see how should they uh, they are doing. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mahapus, please unmute Dr. Professor Shehrin Siddika. Professor Dr. Shehrin Siddika, she is Professor and Head Department of Obstetric and Gynecology in Anorkhan Modern Medical College. Mahapus, please unmute Professor Dr. Shehrin Siddika. She raised her hand. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Shana, for the, such a wonderful program. Definitely, it's a really, really nice program. So I've got a question to the presenter. The, recently, I've got a patient who is uh, having 14 weeks of pregnancy, and unfortunately, she found a large adnectal cyst, a laparoscopic over and cystic tumor done, and where found the endometriotic cancer. So what do you think? How can you manage this sort of patient who's a uh, pregnancy along with the ovarian malignancy and at 14 weeks? No. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you said patient is 14 weeks pregnant? Yeah, yeah, pregnant, yeah, yeah. 14, uh, 14 weeks pregnancy, and uh, actually, it was an incidental finding because uh, all of the she was uh, on twisted over and cyst, and it is uh, the cyst size was uh, around 12 uh, a centimeter, and it was uh, very nicely operated uh, over uh, through the uh, laparoscopy surgery. Now she's 14 weeks, and what would be the your management protocol? Now, what was the final report? What was the pathology report? Endometrial cancer. Endometroid cancer of the yeah, cyst. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, endometroid cancers usually, as I mentioned, uh, are usually low grade cancer or type uh -huh. 1 cancer. Okay. Uh, in the endometroid cancers are confined to the ovary. Yeah. And the ovary has been removed completely. Yeah. And then they do not require any further treatment provided you have done a proper assessment of the abdominal organs. I'm sure in the presence of pregnancy, uh, the staging would not have been possible. Uh, I don't think uh, she, has, she would have had omentic to me. Yeah, I, I had omentic to me. It was negative, and I have taken the uh, fluid and uh, fluid, patronal fluid was also negative. So everything was good, and uh, and she's continuing the pregnancy. So do you suggest anything further? Yeah, uh, even after the end of the pregnancy. Stage one endometrial cancer, endometrial cancer capsule is intact. Uh, then nothing is recommended. Okay. Chemotherapy is not indicated at all in stage one endometrial cancer of the ovary. Okay, yes, that, that, that much we are also continuing in that way, and we, are, we have already uh, counseled the patient that way. So thank you very much for the for your suggestion. Thank you so much. Thank you. What is the histopathology? Is capsule intact or capsule yes. involvement? Capsule was totally intact, yeah. And capsule we have removed it through the uh, we have Thanks. removed the uh, sorry? No, madam. What is the uh, involvement of the capsule histopathology report? Where the capsule is involved or not? The capsule was not involved. It was in situ. Okay. Yeah. If we have no other questions, and now we want to conclude the session. Before that, I we have to uh, show you the poll questions in the hall. All the participants are requested for poll voting. Mahapus, please show the poll questions. Sahana Rohima Madam raised her hand.
Okay. After the end of this poll sessions, we'll unmute Mahapur Madam. Mahapur's Professor Rohima Bhimam, Madam. Please unmute Rohima Bhimam, Madam. Mahapur's. Mahapur's. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sahana. Salam alaikum to everybody. And good evening. So, Madam, we are, I, I, we are on the poll session. After the end of this poll questions, we'll hear from you, Madam, please. Okay. Just after, after one or two minutes. Okay, thank you. We close the poll sessions. Mahapus, please close the poll session. I'm done. Madam, please. Madam, please. Thank you, Madam, please. Your question. Thank you. Thank you very much to give me the chance for yeah. this platform. Actually, Dr. U.D. Bifna, thank you for an elaborate, nice lecture. But on the selfing, you offer it to me. You emphasize who has... Madam, we can't hear you. I think she is disconnected. Yes, yes. I think she is disconnected. So you, you can ask Sheikh Nasrin, Jinnata Nasrin. She has, she yes. raised her. Just a minute. Mahapus, please unmute Jinnata and Dr. Jinnata Nasrin. Jibunapa, you have another question? You raised your hand or it, it is not down? It is, it is previous one. Okay. Sheikh Nasrin. Mahapus, please unmute Sheikh Nasrin. Rohima Madam, again here. Yes, please unmute Rohima Madam. Again, she joined. Mahapus, please unmute Sheikh Nasrin. Sheikh Nasrin. Mahapus? Yes, unmute Rohima Madam. Please, Dr. Rohima Madam. Okay. Rohima Madam, back. Appa, please continue. Rohima Madam? Yes, Madam. Continue, please. From UD Ifna, then what is the age limit for the positive family history going the hysterectomy to do the self incorporectomy at, at the same time? Can you can understand? I, I think uh, you asked for what is the indication for. Selfing of rectomy along with hysterectomy. What is the age? Yes. What is the age limit? Yes, sir. What is the age limit? Yeah. So I suppose you are doing only as I answered already. If you are just considering risk reducing selfing of rectomy, normally according to the international guidelines, uh, it is recommended between 35 and 40 years old. Hysterectomy is generally not recommended for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Okay. But uh, if you do not have any kind of genetic mutation study done, especially in our countries, uh, developing countries where it is not done for many patients, uh, uh, then and when you have a strong family history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, or colonic cancer, and you do not have information about the genetic mutation, then probably uh, around the age of 40 years, uh, uh, you must consider uh, 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 doing hysterectomy as well along with the removal of the tube and the ovaries. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Can I speak now, please? Yes, sir. 
Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to national and international dignitaries. This is a wonderful session. Well, I have one question that my cousin, she's 26 years old, had a history of endometriosis uh, two years back. Then she, she, the endometriosis was so severe, it was been operated. And later on, there's a recurrent. So again, she went to the uh, India Tata Memorial Hospital. They did the laparotomy because it was severe attention. They operated the endometritic cyst again and oophorectomy. And the report came, it was a malignant. So they started chemotherapy. I mean, fertility preserved uh, surgery they did. So they started chemotherapy. After uh, completion of sixth therapy, she came to Dhaka and they um, I, actually she got uh, pregnant because that was the plan after pregnancy uh, everything will be removed accordingly it's, it was her plan now she delivered by c-section now she's in apollo chennai uh, under treatment so paclitaxel and cisplatin all the chemotherapy was given but unfortunately she's too young 26 27 years old uh, the doctors there say they did the pet scan uh, and uh, she had a severe intestinal obstruction, so they had to do laparotomy with colostomy bag and conservative treatment. And again, they uh, started some chemotherapy. But last week, uh, she had severe pain again. She went and they did the uh, PET scan and they found that there was a deposition in the liver. And of course, it is a, a term, uh, advancing disease from last uh, PET scan. So they offered her, they told her to go back to home to stay among the relatives. It is better for her. But, you know, uh, the family is very eager to have, is there any medications or some f further management? So Apollo, they offered her immune therapy. So my question, uh, is there any role of immune therapy? And if it is so, what could be the prognosis for that young lady? Thank you so much. Uh, epithelial cancer, I think uh, this case you are talking about endometrial cancer. Right. Yeah. So basically, uh, as far as uh, ovarian cancer is concerned, uh, epithelial ovarian cancer uh, is supposed to be immunologically cold cancer. Right. Uh, so no non effective immunotherapy in epithelial ovarian cancer. Okay. No, no, oh. not a standard of care. But this particular case, uh, probably they must have done a somatic genetic mutation study. On the tumor, and if you find that uh, PDL or PDL1 is overexpressed, then probably oh. you can try immunotherapy like pembrolizumab. Okay, but generally okay. They're not considered the... enough care. Okay, so even it is positive if the expression is positive. Uh, how what is the prognosis of giving the immunotherapy for her? No, this patient has got uh, advanced malignancy, like you mentioned. She's having metastasis in the liver. Yeah. Uh, and we don't have uh, data about immunotherapy in endometrioid cancer. Right. So exactly, I'll not be able to answer the question. But I don't think, I think it's just going to be uh, improve the uh, progression phase survival by a few months. Okay, I don't think it's going to be uh, producing a complete response. So okay. I think we will be able to prolong the progression-free survival. Survival. Therapy. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Nasrin, let me add. I am sure uh, AK can add some more. Okay. So therapy is a wonderful solution for many metastatic disease. Right. It's showing some promise, but unfortunately, it is not a magic drug for every site. So okay. ovarian cancer, rather, PARP is a big player than immunotherapy yet. So, you know what Dr. Bafna was telling, that we end up in some metastatic setup when we mm -hmm. exhaust all of our weapon, then we look for any target. So right. whether we get anything, and in yeah. that type of situation, with a low PDL one expression, even you know, 1% or 1 to 50% status, sometimes mm -hmm. we try to add, uh, try with some immunotherapy. But the unfortunate mm -hmm. part is, what you ask for the prognosis, the lady, right. Unfortunate lady with a liver mass and right. young lady, all these are bad news. And when we are treating with the best drug in the world for palliation, it is mm -hmm. never curative. Yes. So 
probably yeah. we don't have much good news for her. Yeah. But Dr. Bhavna said this may buy few months or some quality right. of life or may not be because somebody of my colleagues in Chennai who is trying, right. they are trying mm -hmm. with the uh, wishful thinking that it will work. Nobody knows whether it will be working or not because data are not that great and the, mm -hmm. all the data are so scarce that who will be the lucky guy, we don't know. Right. So, Ake, would you like to make some few comments on this? Right. Uh, you, you know, it's a wonderful question, and uh, I agree with all the all the comments. What I would say about immunotherapy, as far as we understand it so far, is it's very much related to hello the ability of a person to respond to what currently is immunotherapy, and the way. Um, we currently identify patients who may be candidates for immunotherapy is based on two factors. One's called PDL1 receptors. Okay, mm -hmm. so the tumor is is evaluated uh, by immunohistochemistry for PDL1 receptors. So programmed um, death ligand number one receptors. So that's the one thing. And the second thing is uh, whether there's something called a CPS score, okay? A CPS score, which is a combined positive score. And what that is, is that is the uh, number of PDL1 staining cells divided by the total number of viable tumor cells multiplied by 100. And that's very, very predictive. CPS scores are very predictive of response to immunotherapy. So for instance, a CPS score of less than 10, not gonna happen. You, basically it's, you're wasting someone's money and time. A CPS score of like 90, very good. And so actually in the United States, our Food and Drug Administration, our FDA has approved immunotherapy, not by cell type, but by whether there are PDL1 receptors in the setting of an endometrioid adenocarcinoma of the endometrium, that's one subset, where in the setting of mismatch repair gene products, there's these four mismatch repair uh, genes that we now check routinely on endometrial cancers. And in the setting where you do have a mutation in them, they usually correlate with some sensitivity to immunotherapy. To the other points that were raised, we don't totally know the, the full survival and uh, response rates to immunotherapy, but it's really around this that's very, very important. Okay, so for your patient, you would have to really interrogate the tumor to understand mm -hmm. the, the, what the CPS score is before you consider before right. you consider adding this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I request our chairpersons of today's session, Professor Dr. Amy Haisar, to conclude the session. Everybody are, and before that, Mahapus, please show the poll winners. And everybody, are, there is the information that from this time and in future, the our program will be on every Sunday instead of Tuesday, because AK is our regular, she's our regular faculty and also some other persons, they are interested to attending the program. For that reason, we have shifted the program. So please remember that our program in from next days, the pro, our program will be on Sunday. So please join in the program from the next Sunday, not in Tuesday. The, our poll winners are Dr. Saira, Dr. Mobina Akhtar, Dr. Lutka Lippi, Dr. Saira from National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Mobina Akhtar, also student, all our gynecology oncology student, Dr. Lutka Lippi, Dhaka Medical College Hospital. Close it. Now I request our, now I request our chairperson and the, uh, to conclude the session. Before that, we are very much grateful to all our participants, all our teachers, our senior teachers, Dr. Probably. Professor Dr. Sabira Khatun, Madam, was with us. I'm not seeing her now. The Professor Dr. Ruhima Begum, Dr. Sherin Siddika, Dr. Professor Dr. Sherin Siddika, Professor Dr. Sheikh Zina Trehana, 
we are very much glad and we are very much grateful to you and also the our bhakta sir and all the other participants because you are the our inspector for you people if you don't join with us and if you don't participate then we can continue the program so we are very much grateful to you and hopefully if you are with us we can continue the program and our oncology club our sir professor ame hi sir shurikul alam sir and our scientific secretary the most dynamic person of the this program he doesn't maintain only this program some other programs of the oncology club it also in every week the gi malignancy the head neck malignancy the genital urinary malignancy and all are running side by side so i request our sir the professor dr ama hi sir the person of session to the sessions sir please conclude the session thank you sana <clears throat> We had a very beautiful evening today, full of discussions. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Nasreen for presenting her paper in a nice way. She has taken quite <coughs> as exercise really very nicely. Sir, you are muted, sir. Are you need to unmute? Oh, muted me. Okay. But yeah. <clears throat> sorry for interruption. My thanks to Dr. Nasri, and also my thanks to Dr. Bafna for taking lots of pain for us, and he has given us enlightened us with his knowledge, particularly all the knowledge. But most of these today's topics discussions was not true. <laughs> Beyond my understanding, I am an old man, or a little person. Yes, you are a very inspirational. However, I could learn many things, and I am happy that other faculties, local faculties, are in our discussion. Our regular faculty, and Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks to all the participants. Really glad that they have taken quite interest in our sessions, and I hope that our this endeavor, particularly the exercise that Dr. Sahana is doing, is going to be of quite useful, possibly is useful for us, and hope which in the future our dining oncology. Hope to see you again, again on Sunday next. We meet every Sunday at night. So proceed again. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. How are you, sir? Okay, bye, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir.